Um, I'll, I'll introduce you now. Marion is a leading transport and cities expert with a long history in public policy. She's worked on tax policy for the Federal Treasury and led the design and development of the MyGov account. She has provided expert analysis and advice on labour market policy for the Federal Government, the Business Council of Australia, and at the Australian National University. Marion joined the Grattan Institute in 2015 to establish the transport program, which she expanded to include cities in 2016. At Grattan, Marion has published on a wide variety of topics, including investment in transport infrastructure, cost overruns, value capture, traffic congestion, discount rates, and the ways COVID crisis is changing Australian cities. Her most recent report was on light vehicles and the team plans to follow up later in 2022 on heavy vehicles. Marion Terrell is a friend of the MTF, uh, a very popular speaker, and I welcome you here tonight. Thank you, Marion, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much. So I am um, just wanted to, uh, so it's great to be back. I've, um, I think this might be the fourth time I've spoken to you over the years, but the last time I talked to you anyway was about transport mega projects in Melbourne. And um, so, but, but I, I think there are a few new people here. So just to, by way of context, um, for those who are not familiar with Grattan in any detail, we're a public policy think tank so the work that I do is independent. We don't do commissions or anything like that. Um, and we put an emphasis on being rigorous and practical. So, um, so, so that's kind of the backdrop to what I'm, I'm going to talk about or the way that I'm going to approach this. What I'm doing, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is a report that I published late last year. Um, it's called the Grattan Car Plan. And so I'm going to explain the research to you tonight, what we looked at and how we did it and what we found and what we think governments should do about it. But since you've asked me back, <laughs> I thought I would also um, give you a sneak preview of some future work that we're going to publish a bit later in the, the year, um, which Jonathan mentioned on, on heavy vehicles. Um, so our emphasis is national, but there's plenty that's relevant to Melbourne in what I've got to say. So um, I'll, I'll give you the, the kind of in a nutshell version of it, um, of what I want to cover in a bit more depth today. Um, really what this is about is the fact that Australians drive cars that are big and they're dirty and they've got high carbon emissions. And, and without any government action, it's really slow to change. So we do lay behind other countries, but that's got an upside as well as a downside, which is that we don't have to invent the solutions. They're already out there. We just have to catch up to what people are doing in the US and the UK and Europe and Japan and South Korea and so on. So in, in some ways it's easier perhaps to be a laggard. And the, the way to do this or the way that we're recommending to do it is to set a ceiling or a standard that manufacturers importing cars here have to abide by, and that ratchets down the amount of carbon emissions over time. This policy could really help us to meet the commitment of net zero by 2050. Um, and the way it would do that is it would change the mix of new cars sold so that there'd be more electric vehicles. And even um, while, there's, while there are still many um, petrol and diesel vehicles, they would still be lower emissions variants of those cars. Um, and it would save drivers money. Um, of course, carbon emissions are important, but they're not everything. And um, you more than most people would be very aware of this. So I'm also gonna talk about local pollutants from tailpipes. And also what I think doesn't get spoken about enough, which is the fact that cheaper driving is great in one way, but it, is, it does exacerbate other problems of congestion and the dominance of public space in urban environments. So um, I'll, I'll get into uh, it now. And, and I should just say, um, if you've got questions along the way, just ask, that's absolutely fine, there's not that many of us. Um, so I think the moment of truth is when I share my screen. So let's just see how that goes. Okay, um, fantastic. So, um, so this is what I'm going to, going to um, 
this is a structure what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the start at the top with this, just giving you a, a sense of what the situation is like today. So, um, so th this is a this slide is showing you um, really what I'm wanting to make the point about here is the nature of the, the cars we drive um, are they're changing. So people, the most dramatic thing here really is that people are increasingly choosing SUVs um, in preference to passenger cars. And that's particularly picked up in the last 10 years. And I think if you look out the window, it's kind of obvious, you can easily see it. Um, I'd also point out that it's less obvious, but there's also this shift to light commercial vehicles, and that's predominantly utes. So, um, so the two effects, 88% uh, of it is utes. So these also some things like the kind of transit vans and that sort of thing, but mainly utes, some of which are very large. So um, large vehicles and also petrol vehicles. So um, about 99% of the new light vehicles sold in Australia last year had internal combustion engines and two thirds of them were petrol. As well as that, they have very high carbon emissions. So we've made this chart to, to show you a country that also prefers big cars, Germany, um, compared to a lot of European countries, they like big cars like we do. But at every, every vehicle size, you're seeing the same thing that our cars um, have, have higher emissions than those in Germany. We've got not very many electric vehicles by international standards. Um, this chart is slightly out of date, um, actually, so uh, uh, which I'll come to, but 2021, um, we picked up to 2%. Um, but the, I guess the point remains that we are well behind many other countries in electric car sales, but they're picking up really fast. So, so this is a new chart, um, which is not in the report. So we've used the latest data here um, just to show you how, dramatic, how dramatically this tide is turning. So the numbers are still very small. Um, but the number sold in 2021 was three times the number sold in 2020. So um, the, the switch is on. So, so that's the that's the landscape um, of um, of the vehicles that we've got. So I'm going to talk about the um, getting sort of what would change low emissions vehicles. So the, the, I guess the key point here is um, you know it's pretty widely accepted that the most efficient way um, to get emissions down is an economy-wide carbon price. And it's equally accepted, I think, probably that that's not on the immediate horizon. So all governments, um, all state and territory governments and the Commonwealth government to different degrees have committed to net zero by 2050. And so we're in the situation of achieving that by sector by sector strategies, rather than setting the price and letting people make their own decisions. But it's, you could think about it within the frame of a, a small sector carbon price. Light vehicles are really important in the carbon emissions, carbon emission reduction task, because they account for about 11% of Australia's total emissions. And uh, the date of 2035 is important. Uh, so if you work back from 2050, um, cars do last around 15 years or a little bit more than 15 years on average. And so 2035 is an important date because the, the petrol car that is sold in 2035 will um, be just coming off the road roughly in 2050. So our, our core recommendation is that Australia should adopt an emission standard or ceiling and for new light vehicles applied across the offering of each manufacturer. So I'll just explain what I mean by this. Um, uh, it would, what it would mean is um, basically the Commonwealth Government setting a regulation applying to manufacturers 
so that if a manufacturer wanted to sell a high emitting vehicle, such as a large petrol ute, for example, then they could do that, um, but they would have to offset that above the ceiling emission by selling enough low emissions or zero emissions vehicles like EVs or cleaner petrol or diesel vehicles so that they didn't exceed the average that, that applied to them. And the ceiling would lower each year just gradually so that it would achieve, that it would get down to zero emissions by 2035. What, what I want to stress about this, you could think of it as a sector, a sectoral carbon price, um, but because manufacturers still get to decide what kind of cars they sell, so they know their customers, they know what sells, what's profitable, no, and no one's forced to buy a particular type of car, nothing's forbidden. It's just um, that over time, the fleet would become lower emitting on average. Now let me show you what this would look like. Uh, so this is just showing you um, kind of how, how we did the modeling. Um, basically, we're here, or we, we were thinking we'd start in 2024 and finish in 2035. So you can sort of go there a bit faster or a bit slower, but yet the destination is the same whichever way you go. We, we focus mainly on the central scenario, but we just wanted to see how much difference it would make. Um, all of these start um, with an assumption of 143 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2024. And um, I guess the other thing I'd say is all of them, all three of these scenarios are somewhat, somewhat ambitious, but they are also quite realistic. They're not as ambitious as, for example, the, um, the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries had as a voluntary standard, but, but more ambitious. So um, I guess another thing just to mention here is that the price of electric vehicles is coming down fast and it's forecast to be equivalent to petrol and diesel vehicles before 2030 for passenger cars and mid-size and larger SUVs. So sort of in well under 10 years there'll be equivalents in, in most segments of the light vehicle market. And, and a lot of manufacturers are switching to electric vehicles only regardless of Australian government policy. So, um, you know, we're not, we're not at the crest of the wave, but I think in, in a lot of ways benefiting from what is happening elsewhere. So um, I will just show you what now this um, would look like. Um, so this is sort of the core of what we discovered in just trying to quantify what effect this policy would have. So if you think of the central scenario, it would, um, reduce carbon emissions by 24 um, million tons, 24 megatons uh, by 2030. Um, now that's, um, we no longer have a 2030 emissions target since December, but when we published this research, we still did have a 2030 emissions target. And this, um, and, and which was 56 um, megatons by, 2030. So the ambitious path would get you more than halfway there, just this policy alone. Um, so you can see it's, it's a powerful policy and what's, and that's just by 2030, but the real power of this policy is off into the longer term future, like cars have just got a very long lag on them. So it is a, it's a, a very, it, it is a powerful policy for reducing emissions. So um, so this central scenario here, again, if, if we had retained the 2030 target, it would have achieved 42% of the total task. So it's good at reducing emissions. Um, people do worry about what it's going to cost drivers. And so we did spend quite a lot of time on that question. This, what this slide is showing you is that um, an emission ceiling would save drivers money. So I'll explain why uh, that, or it's kind of how that sits with people's concern about the cost of buying electric vehicles. 
um, over time there would be more and more electric vehicles as electric vehicles became cheaper and cheaper. But uh, there's a lot of emissions reductions available from hybrids and even just from cleaner petrol and diesel vehicles. And so when, uh, and, and the price differential, for example, um, to a hybrid is, is very small um, generally. So you can, with quite a small initial outlay, the savings in running costs are very substantial. So a person buying a new vehicle under an emission ceiling would save um, on average $900 in the first five years and an average of more than $2,000 over the life of the vehicle. So, I mean, it does, it, it sort of depends on a lot of things, but um, the electric vehicles are so cheap to run that, you know, as the price comes down, this is the, the calculation is just changing very fast. So that's the, basically the argument about why this is worth doing and what it would achieve. I'm going to now um, uh, move on to kind of our readiness, if you like, for EVs. So people raise three concerns typically when they're asked about EVs and when they're surveyed, that sort of thing. And they, they are the price of the vehicle, the convenience of charging, and their ability to take longer trips. So um, we did, I'm going to show you our work on the convenience of, of charging. I suppose just to, th this is really um, basically the at home or overnight sort of charging. And um, it, it's, um, it's tempting to reach for a one size fits all solution, but we ended up thinking, you know, people have a very wide variety of circumstances and for the most part, we think it will be straightforward. So, so this is why we think it. Two thirds of households that own a car live in a house that they own or are buying. So that's just, um, so the majority of people are, are living in those situations. And of these, almost all of them have got off street parking. 95% have got off street parking. So in that, if, if you are one of those people, it's quite a simple matter for you that you get an electrician out to check that your wiring can support a charger. Um, I even know someone who, um, where I live, who just plugs it into a PowerPoint in the wall, no problem. <laughs> uh, so, so it, um, but, but people generally put in these sort of faster chargers, but not, they're not very fast, but slightly faster. Um, and so that so that's kind of the dominant picture of what's going on. So the, the, the remaining third of households that have a car, most of them still do live in houses, um, but they're renters. And, and again, it's usually going to be straightforward, even if they are renting, because it's just not expensive to to prepare the um, the garage or whatever they have. When it comes to the, so we've got 11% of people, of households with a car that live in an apartment. Some of them are rented, some of them are owner occupied. And some of them will be fine, um, but others will find that it is not possible or it is too expensive to install the charging point. And um, <laughs> so there, that's, I think that's the type of story that we typically hear. Um, reassuring for Melbourne people, um, it's much more of an issue probably in New South Wales where apartment living is, in Sydney basically, apartment living is just much more common. So in, in these situations, that's where publicly accessible charging comes in. Uh, not that people with it at home wouldn't use publicly accessible charging to some other time, but um, you know, the, there will be some households who don't have an at-home option and for them th this network is very important. For the stage of, of um, uptake of EVs that we've got in Australia, our thinking was um, that this is a reasonable number of publicly accessible 
charges by international standards. Now, it, again, it, it, this is very particular to an individual circumstances. So for some people, it's not a problem. You know, you work at the South Melbourne markets and you go and there's a charger there and you can just leave your car there all day and it's free and you're fine. Um, for some people, that it, it'll be a much more significant barrier. Um, it is just a, a bit of a mixed story. But on the whole, um, charging just seems like much less of a problem than I had thought, given the way people talk about it. I, I want to talk about the, um, the concern that many people have about price. So, um, you know, electric vehicles are more expensive um, than petrol and diesel vehicles, obviously, and, and lots of people are, are held back by that. And, and now thinking on that is, um, that's kind of the way the world is, but um, the, the federal government could put downward pressure on price very easily. Um, at the moment, there are restrictions on importing secondhand vehicles and also um, people directly importing new vehicles if that competes with the manufacturer's own distribution network. And those kinds of regulations are, are unnecessary. They don't apply in other countries. For example, in New Zealand, there's a, a very active secondhand market in electric vehicles. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of make things harder for ourselves to get a bigger range rather than um, everyone needing to buy a new Tesla or Jaguar or something like that. The world has got a lot of secondhand electric vehicles in it and also just a lot of cheaper models that aren't available in Australia. So that's, um, that's sort of the, what I wanted to say about electric vehicles um, and, and about the question of, of sort of the, up, the our readiness, if you like, for electric vehicles. Um, but those of us who care about cities also worry about tailpipe pollutions. And even if every car sold from now on was electric, we'd still have most of the cars sold yesterday on the road 15 years from now. So, it, you know, the, the problem of tailpipe pollutants is, is here for the um, long term, really. So there is, in thinking about what could be done about this, there's a, a chicken and egg problem um, with current vehicles. So, the quality of petrol used in Australia is really poor. Um, it, and it's in fact so poor that it can't support the latest pollution reducing technology in cars. And, and so we, we hear these stories about manufacturers having to detune their cars for the Australian market, because if they send them as, you know, as the Europeans or the Americans drive them or the Japanese, then um, all the alert lights will go on because of the filthy petrol that we use. So <clears throat> the, the nature of the dirty petrol is basically sulfur and aromatics. And what's wrong with these is that when they're burnt, these produce pollutants and they, they do kill uh, about 300 people a year. Like they're, they're very toxic. They also cause all sorts of um, health conditions and exacerbate health conditions, particularly in vulnerable people, so kind of children or old people, um, uh, or people who are, you know, have serious health conditions. So um, not a very glamorous problem, but, but it is a really important problem. The, the problem is well known and understood. And so the, there's been a commitment um, that Australian refineries would improve the quality of the petrol that's refined on shore. Now, that's a really small fraction. We're going to hear more about this, I'm pretty sure, with all the um, events unfolding in Ukraine and the spike in the price of oil. But basically, um, we don't refine much on, on shore. When we do, we import the feedstock for it largely. So, um, and, and we've kept these two refineries open with a big dollop of of Commonwealth money uh, for sort of for fuel security reasons. Um, but the reality is that, that there, there are these problems and, and the commitment is that the petrol that's refined on shore will be improved by mid 2024. But, you know, 
people are dubious about whether this is really going to happen. So the problem of dirty petrol is, is sort of has been around, but it, it, it seems to be kind of um, perhaps not as much commitment as you might hope to cleaning it up. And, and cleaner petrol, so it's, it's important in its own right, but it's also important because it would then be possible for Australians to have access to better vehicle technology. So much of the world um, has cars that ad adhere to what they call Euro 6D standards. Euro 7 is coming in in 2025. We're still on Euro 5. So again, all these solutions are out there. Other countries are, have done them. And um, there isn't really any particular reason why Australia couldn't do more other than a lack of, of commitment. There, there is a particular problem with trucks, and I just thought I'd share this with you because we're, we're focusing on this quite a lot in our new report, which we'll publish in the middle of the year. Um, so the <laughs> our trucks are really old. Well, they're, they're, they're older than um, in many uh, comparable countries. And the, um, the reason why that matters is because old trucks are dramatically worse at producing pollutants. Um, I actually don't have the figure in front of me, but like they're, it, for some of the key pollutants, they're sort of 60 times worse. They just, they're far, far worse. So um, the technology for um, reducing pollution in trucks has come an awful long way in the last 20 years. So having this very old fleet by international standards does lock in um, much more toxic uh, pollution or tailpipe pollutions than happen elsewhere and than happen in com comparable countries. So we will have more to say about trucks um, in, a, in a couple of months. So I'm going to now turn to the final um, thing though, and which I think um, might be an interesting topic for discussion, and that's about sort of the place of driving um, in the whole regime. So to start off with, I, I talked to you before about the fact that um, that electric vehicles are much cheaper to drive and, and like it's, you're probably well aware that you know, the diesels are the most expensive. I mean, there, there's a bit of a size difference going on here, but essentially um, for a higher upfront cost, the running costs of an electric vehicle are very cheap and it's great for drivers, great for lowering tailpipe pollutants, great for lower carbon emissions. But there, the other downsides of driving remain. Congestion, accidents, dominating public space, including continual commitments to build more freeways and more roads. So given the likely effect, um, or the well-documented effect, I suppose, that cheaper driving means people tend to drive a little more rather than a little less, um, and the bigger the difference, the more true that is, I guess the question is, what can we expect to be the effect on Melbourne? So I've got a few speculative points to make. So first of all, the big issue, I think, is what has happened to population and thinking about sort of driving in Melbourne. Um, since COVID led to the closure of borders, there's been this major shrinking. This is the Australian population. For Victoria, it's actually, I think it's um, possibly even more dramatic. Um, so sorry, I haven't charted it for Victoria, but um, net, uh, so in Victoria or in Melbourne, most um, our natural increase is, rate is very low. So most of our population growth has come from net overseas migration. I think our um, natural growth has been 0.7 or 0.8% a year. And so we've, so we've been a fast growing city and that's been mainly coming from net overseas migration. So we went from 80 or 90,000 uh, net overseas migrants per year um, to minus 56 in 2021. And I, I think that's the largest uh, net migration loss for the state on record. And of course, this has got um, so two implications I'm going to um, finish up with you, which are um, what does it mean for passengers? 
So this is a chart, I, um, I haven't updated, it's, it's, a lot, it's quite labour intensive, but the, this, the main point I wanted to make it was not actually what happened last week so much as um, what you can learn from this is that for the whole of the, if you look at Melbourne in particular, we almost, almost the entire time, whether we're, we're in lockdown or not, um, our driving rates uh, had sort of pulled apart from, pulled like pulled up relative to public transport rates. Um, so the switch out of public transport and into cars is much more than just a response to lockdowns. And there's, there's quite a lot of international literature starting to emerge now about this. Um, so it is a worldwide phenomenon. It, it, it is not that hard to understand why people are doing that. And so looking forward, I think that's kind of one of the big challenges um, for all of us to consider. Um, and I um, also want to show you um, what it means for freight, road freight. So um, I guess the bottom line, I think, is that there is no reason to imagine that the drop in population is likely to mean any sustained increase in basically trucks on the road, um, so freight volumes. Um, it, it's so, I mean, again, we're, we're sort of in the middle of it, so it's a bit hard to, to be too confident in predicting. But um, even if the data, were, like the data isn't, hasn't caught up to where we're at at the moment, but even if it does show reduction, you know, when we looked at the long sweep of history, we thought it is very unlikely to be sustained. So I think the trucks we've got are, are sort of the trucks we've got, and um, it's basically driven off um, largely off just the, the size of population, the amount, the, uh, the number of tonne kilometres per person has been pretty stable for 15 years. So then it just depends how many people you've got that, that's really determining that. Um, so unless there is a, a major change in prices or something like that, again, um, there's no reason to imagine that at this point. I'm going to just um, show you the recommendations that we made. The, these are really, they're, um, they're really aimed at the federal government. So um, to impose an emissions standard or ceiling, and we specified the, the, the rate at which that would ratchet down to zero in 2035. When it comes to charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, there's both Commonwealth and state money in this and possibly local, I'm sure you can tell me that. Um, but um, I guess what we were thinking is there's quite a lot of commercial providers too, and the, the trick for government is not to crowd them out or not to kind of, um, yeah, encroach on territory, which is um, sort of commercially viable. We would like to see um, when properties, residences are bought and sold, that um, it's, there's a standard, um, the, st the standard does include reporting on whether there's um, charging infrastructure and what type and that the National Construction Code be updated to uh, where there is um, off-street parking to have at least to have the wiring ready so that the installation of a charger is um, it, it's much less expensive than retrofitting it um, to have the wiring in place. Um, on support for buyers I mentioned the second-hand vehicles um, and um, labelling, consumer labelling would probably be helpful as well. On the tailpipe pollution, it's, again, the federal government um, does need to um, ensure that it does meet the, uh, that um, both onshore and offshore refined petrol meet the international standards by 2024. And, uh, and then um, to, to make the corresponding change so that our vehicles um, catch up to the, the kinds of standards that are applying in other countries. So, um, so I guess I'll show you today what the light vehicle policy landscape's like in Australia right now. I, I think there's been an absence of policy action for quite some years now. And so we are lagging the rest of the world, both in carbon emissions and tailpipe pollutants. 
And I think there's a lot that we could be doing better that just doesn't seem that hard or ambitious. So I think the harder challenge perhaps lies in these questions about managing congestion, balancing access to scarce public space between drivers and pedestrians and other users. Um, uh, so your domain. <laughs> uh, so thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to just stop this sharing now. And um, uh, questions or discussion? Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Marion, for, for that cutting edge analysis of the light vehicle landscape in Australia. As you as you said, we, we we concentrate on our strategic program, namely active transport buses and choice. Um, and really, do, do we get such a comprehensive briefing on on the state of play with cars? So we're very grateful, and it's a treat for the MTF to 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 look at the economics and the rapid churn in in the market to understand where we're headed. What um, it's yeah, I, th I, th I think you were understating the, the situation. The, this government, I, well, Australia in general, is not very ambitious on, on, on these questions. And this discussion comes at a good time, given the looming federal election. We just had a, a forum on, on cycling um, in the federal election, and this, this will be really good information for people who are keen to see the landscape change again. But it's time now to ask some questions, and I think you, you're a little bit time constrained. Is that right? Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sort of expecting to finish at seven or a little after seven. Yeah. Sure. Okay. We'll 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 aim to do that. Uh, th there's a few questions to begin with in the in the chat, which I'll reference in a bit. But I invite other people who'd like to ask a question, and I'll have to restrict the number of speakers. But take your chance now and hitting the reactions button and the raise hand function so that it'll come up. I'll just do it for myself first of all, um, so that I can see who's ready to ask a question. So feel free to do that now, and I'll ask the first question in the chat, which is from. Um, Richard Stockman, uh, who asks what the motivation for resistance by the government, to, why, why is the government resistant to put increased tariffs on, for example, um, on, on yeah. uh, cars, I guess, or fuel? I, I don't know. What, what, what do you mean, Richard? Sorry, just, sorry, just earlier in the presentation, Mary, you said there's yeah. a, we're lagging behind as a um, resistance for us to put some tariffs on those heavy diesel and, and heavy petrol vehicles and what's the motivation like why wouldn't they want to do that yeah I think um, it's been interesting actually watching what happened um, at the end of last year because there had been this sort of um, pretty unedifying climate war killing the weekend type of um, debate and I think it had frightened the opposition off and and then it, it then there's an about face. So I think this this issue has become um, used, I suspect, to differentiate. Well, I guess my this is just me speculating, but to differentiate sort of more urban um, or regional from urban, and to try to sort of evoke um, a notion of um, something like a traditional type of view, I don't know, like a, I struggle to answer your question, to be honest, like it makes no sense to me. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's just from being a, in, in politics, I guess, a little bit that we are, um, popularity, I guess, is, is, is they think they might be letting some people down, perhaps, I don't know, um, that wouldn't be the popular vote for them to do, perhaps, but um, I think the a big surge in, in electric vehicles becoming quite popular, aren't we, so that's making a big difference. Being cheaper, I think, makes a big difference. I think it sort of they're, they're less elite, they're more they're more useful, um, they're more attractive because they're um, like a, not everybody. People care about different things, but I think most people do care about cost and about just general function. Um, yeah, and and so as those things improve, the whole thing, the calculus changes. I don't know. <laughs> thanks for your question, Richard, and, and thanks for, for trying to answer a, a question that's really hard to answer, as you said, because um, there's just not enough to go on. And no doubt the, the debate will heat up again in, in the coming weeks post-budget. Um, there's, there's a couple of other comments I'll call out 
if while I wait for people to put up their hand, if they'd like to ask a question of Marianne, um, Melissa points out that um, that the cost may be um, a barrier to many, but um, but so will quick and convenient charging is not all housing types will be able to cater to charging. As you know, it's it, 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 this is a pressing and urgent policy problem for for Melbourne, uh, particularly in the inner city where there's heritage considerations and um, uh, a lack of off street parking, as well as a need to future proof um, new developments. So um, yeah, it's front of mind for many members of the MTF at the moment as to how to how to run that power cord across the footpath without tripping everyone over. Um, did, 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 do you see any emerging technologies that that you've found during your study of this of this sector that you can see working in the Australian context, particularly in the inner cities of of Australia? Yeah, I, there are there, there's. Um, all sorts of different things are being tried around the world and there's some really great things that, like for example in London I think they're um, like where every parking meter is they're having a little <laughs> a little cord um, in some parts I'm not sure what districts and and you certainly uh, the last time I was overseas was in Paris and saw um, sort of parking meter like charges all over the place um, on the streets and I kind of think um, our, like Mel inner Melbourne feels dense to us, but really um, if we kind of look at uh, broader, it, it's not at all. The other thing that I think um, perhaps is an exciting way forward um, once we get some tech entrepreneurs doing this, but um, ultra fast chargers. So um, some of them are like in, in Korea and in Europe, you're seeing these um, extremely fast charges with very high um, charge, which uh, I, I'm not an expert on this, I've got to say, but I, I think that the technology for ch fast charging um, in terms of speed is improving a lot. And then if you think about this problem of heritage considerations and a power port that cords across put footpaths, which are clearly sort of not viable, the, and the other option is that you do go like it's paid like a petrol station, I guess, but you go in and you charged up in a very short amount of time instead of, you know, an hour or overnight or whatever it might be, depending on the speed of the charger. So, yeah, different. Yeah, there's a lot of different strategies out there. So I feel like this is not a problem we need to start from scratch on. No, no, indeed, and uh, I, th I think we could probably dedicate an entire session to to, to the thorny question of, of curbside charging. Uh, <laughs> and Jane has um, just stoked the fire by asking that, about info of, of the, the cost of inverted commas free public charging. But I, I don't want to open that can of worms because I know that's a that's a, that's a ninety minute discussion, and maybe it's one that we can schedule later on, and perhaps even even rope you in, Marion, for your economist brain. To talk uh, about the, views, yeah. Yes, and no doubt you do on, on the public good and uh, and and how much of uh, free electricity the people should be giving away to private citizens. But um, I've I've got a, maybe a question to end on if it's okay because I, I haven't seen any hands up and uh, th this is a pressing problem in my part of the world where the Altona refineries just shut down so Exxon Mobil has stopped producing um, and we're now importing um, bulk product from finished product from Singapore. To be offloaded at Point Jellybrand, piped through to Altona, and then pumped on to Yarraville to to um, make up for the shortfall in in refined capacity. But do, will the finished product from Singapore be be cleaner, or are we just going to continue to import dirty fuel as long as we have that standard in Australia? Um, so I'm I'm not an expert on this, but what I would say is Singapore exports fuel to many countries that have more stringent regulations than us. So they don't have any lack of technical capacity. But if we don't demand it to be clean, why would they sell it to us cleaner than they need to? Yeah, no, that's that's perfectly logical response. And um, I look forward to the 2024 trigger if, if and when it happens. Um, I'm, I'm sure yeah. it'll be influenced by the current um, election. There's no doubt that tailpipe emissions will be a big topic of conversation as well as well electric cars for the second time in a row but we've just hit seven o'clock and I, I want to thank you for making the time to to be here for the fourth time with the MTF um, it's been a treat to hear about something that we don't often think about the, the the economics of of light vehicles in Australia thank you so much for your time oh it's my pleasure and next time in person I hope yes fingers crossed <laughs> look forward to seeing you then and good luck with your heavy heavy vehicle paper very much look forward to seeing that Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Good night, Marion. Thank you again.
Wonderful. Well, th th that was a fascinating discussion and um, will no doubt st stimulate further questions.